Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to Richard Skipper Celebrates. For those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. My show is about celebrating artists and their body of worth. What makes a great artist? Not only is it what happens on the stage, it's everything that leads to them getting on the stage. And I am very, very excited about today's very special guest star, uh, Tova Felcha. A lot of you may know Tova, I think she's here somewhere. Tova? Yes, I'm right here. It's off. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, you may know her from Golda's Balcony. Uh, She's played Leona Helmsley, uh, Yentl. Uh, I even saw her on the Love Boat a few weeks ago. So so, Tova, it's very good to see you. Uh, My assistant is going to try to get your photographs to us as quickly as possible so we can share some of the photographs of your amazing journey Uh, to the theater and beyond. Uh, But before we get there, uh, we are in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, It's been 346 days since our theaters shut down. So I want to ask you, how are you doing really in the midst of everything? Well, look, as my mother Lily would say, happiness is a choice. So you have to get up some days and will it so. Uh, because of my age, I'm already inoculated. We got our second shots yesterday. And no, I'm not 75, but once you're over 65, I qualify. And um, I'm happy about that. Also, the one good thing that happened with this pandemic was a quarantine that enabled me to write my memoir, Lilyville, Mother, Daughter, and Other Roles I Played. So I was able to shine that up in my sequester, if you will, uh, mostly in our summer home in Quam, but also here uh, in in Manhattan, the city of my birth and the city I love so much. Well, you... No, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, it was, as much as it was a health crisis, it became an artistic advantage, but of course I had to adjust. I mean, as you said, the theaters shut, as did all our concerts, all my concerts in Boca, did Del Rey, Chicago, Houston, Ventura, Benito La Comedia. So I couldn't make a living in the theater. So I proceeded with my book and I was lucky that Hachette contacted me, uh, asked to wish me and I had a great literary agent. So I supported myself with that advance. That's wonderful. Uh, I want to ask you uh, what your calendar actually looked like uh, on March 10th of last year. Everything shut down on the 11th. What was ahead for you uh, beyond the book, of course? I was to do 13 concerts of Tova is Leona uh, in a return engagement to to Boca Raton and uh, to Del Rey. I was also supposed to, I wanted, of course, I, I'm a skier. I was going to go to Aspen. So that completely mm-hmm. blew up. And uh, I was, I'm a world traveler. When I'm not working, I love to travel the world. And I was going to go to Ethiopia to go inside the country and study the ancient civilizations. And of course, part of the Jewish people got isolated there. Uh, my God, they didn't even have Hanukkah before we airlifted them and got them into Israel. So I was going to do that. Of course, all that was canceled. All my concerts were canceled. And oh, oh, the most important thing is I was doing a play called Sisters-in-Law where I played Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And that play was to come into New York. And it's about, uh, it's by Jonathan Shapiro, produced uh, by Elizabeth Weber and the Annenberg, the Wallace Annenberg Center uh, for the Arts in uh, in Los Angeles. And it was to come into New York and that was scrapped. And uh, my beloved, brilliant friend, Patty LuPone, with whom I did one episode of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, her show, of her production company, the production she was in, apparently got dropped. I don't know if it will, ever, if it will be revived and whether it will come in when all this ends. We're hoping it ends in September, I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, who knows? I mean, if we only had a crystal ball to look ahead. Um, I always like to begin my interviews 
uh, by going back to the five-year-old you. And in this case, that will be the five-year-old Terry Sue, uh, which basically, yes, takes us into um, the, you know, your book. What, tell us a little bit, I know that you were from Scarsdale. Uh, you have a brother. Uh, is he older or younger than you? I have an older brother, Dr. David Fauci, who's a PhD MD. Like many first-born Jewish males, he has two degrees. He's an emergency room specialist. He was, he was head of the theater at Cornell University. So um, he is now still a tenured professor there. He stepped down as head of the theater at Cornell. And he wrote one play. He wrote many, he wrote many plays. But his first play, Miss Evers Boys, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and an Emmy Award winning movie of the week. So that's my beloved, incredible brother. That's great. Uh, so and, uh, the five-year-old Terry Sue in Scarsdale. Well, first of all, um, my mother, Lily, was born April the 18th, 1911, on a dining room table in the Bronx. <laughs> and I was born in Manhattan uh, at 90th and Lexington, approximately, at a, a place that's defunct called Beth David Hospital. And... Uh, my first childhood memories were of the combustive Kaplan clan who lived at 955 Walton Avenue. My aunt and uncle, Harold and Mae Silverman, my cousins, Peter and Jonathan Silverman. Johnny was my age, so he was my crib partner and bath time partner. And uh, my grandparents, Ada and Gershon. And my mother and father had lived on Park Avenue. My father got drafted into the war. My brother was born uh, while my father was overseas. My mother got pregnant the minute he was drafted. And uh, my mother left the apartment at Park Avenue and moved back with her parents. So they all lived in this conglomerate. And 955 was like a playhouse for me. And then uh, when I was born, my father, after the war, my father made plans to build his own dream house with my mother in Scarsdale. So my memories, we moved there by the time I was three. Uh, Dwight David Eisenhower was president of the United States. It was a big thrill because that was my father's general. My father left a new dealer for World War II. He came back a Republican, which now, unfortunately, is not such a great thing to be. But in those days, the Republican Party was, was, still, the party, was still the party of Lincoln. People walked worked across the table, and there was still a bipartisan spirit uh, in, the, in the government and decent men who would stand up against McCarthy, no matter what their party was. And I pray to God we have just a facsimile of morality uh, from the Republican Party based on evidence and uh, uh, and this trial. Well, I join you so, in that uh, prayer. Well, now, I want to go ahead. I'm so sorry. It, I was in Scarsdale at this vast house. It was a big California ranch house, 13 rooms. And I was both ecstatic and lonely because I went from combustion to isolation. And I remember the teeny kid, forget, forget five, I was three. I would look in the mirror and say, Are you real? Do you really exist? And some people thought that was sad. It was not sad to me. I was wondering whether my image was, in fact, myself or whether there was a second person. And I would talk to the mirror and I would then start to do plays in front of the mirror. And then I toured my show to the bathroom where I could have a little <laughs> in front of the bathroom mirror and do that. And eventually I would come out and do little playlets for my uh, parents who were just, you know, the best fans you could get. Well, at least my father was. My mother was a tough, uh, a tough, she was a tough sell. She was a tough mm -hmm. sell, and that's why we have a book. She really came from a European tradition. My parents were both American. All my grandparents were European from England, Russia, Germany, and Austria. So the Feltschus mm -hmm. are Austrian, pretty much, Vienna, and the Kaplans are Russian, who then came to England by the 1880s and then left from England for the United States in 1902. But um, my, we inherit stuff, not just epigenetically, but my mother did not overpraise her children, lest you put a cane at her, let, lest, lest the devil come down and strike mm. you, you dead from being having hubris, from having overweening pride. And- Wait, uh, uh, Excuse me, but was her mom the same way? I remember Ada, who was British, also being contained, but she loved her grandchildren. What was not to love when you had a baby? But mm -hmm. by the time I was 18, I asked my mother if she loved me, if you'd like to really get into it. And she was just out of fiddling. She said, do I love you? Of course I love you. Who takes you in the station wagon to your 
to your lessons. I read House Beautiful. I gave you my whole life. You wanted to go to the Hotel Ansonia to study with Madame Olga Eyes. He was 16 years old. I picked you up at Scarsdale High. I drove you to that place. And then eventually she taught me how to take the train and the subway. And the subway's the one. What Always prompted did. you to ask that question at 18? She never told me. Never said it. And my father, uh, one of the, when my father eventually got sick and would die, I was, it was, he was already almost 86. But when I would come home and my father was well and my mother was well, they were married 63 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would come home from Sarah Lawrence and my father would say, Lily, Lily, she's coming up the driveway. She's coming to the garage door. She's coming. She's, co she's coming here. And my mother would say, all right, what is she wearing? So that was kind of the, <laughs> the relationship of my mother and father to me. My father was the one who gave me unconditional love, who really gave me a sentence. He didn't say it to me, but I said it to my children. And it was based on a feeling, uh, which was, I love you because you breathe. And that's what I told mm -hmm. them and as, as they grew up. I really used a lot of my father's parenting skills. He was so happy to be alive after the war. He was having lost his own father at 16 from uh, from viral pneumonia. My oh. father, my grandfather came home from Europe on a Monday and died on a Saturday from walking pneumonia that became pneumonia. And there was nothing to cure him in 1926. And he had touched death. So that man really grabbed the rainbow ring of life. And he was a litigator. And it's probably when I became an actress, because as you know, litigators write their own scripts. They write their own plays. Now we've got some pictures here that we're gonna share. Now this is the cover of your book. This is your mom. So he got them on here. So my assistant, Chuck Pennington, thank you. So uh, um, Lilyville, uh, the title. Let's, if we can go back just one. Um, uh, the, the title of your book. I have a question before we move forward with this. Um, I interviewed you a few years ago uh, when you did Dolly brilliantly uh, at the Paper Mill Playhouse. Thank and uh, really a big takeaway for me from that interview was the amount of research that went into uh, the background of Dolly and the history of Dolly. Um, writing this book, what was your point of reference when you started? And have you always kept journals? I, my mother did. I did not keep journals, but I have a very good long-term memory, probably from using my memory all my life to earn a living. Um, I wrote this book after my mother died, perhaps to make my mother ubiquitous, because though the story with my mother and I started like this, it did end like this. Uh, as, I, as I write, you know, I know that when Hachette asked me to write a memoir, they probably expected sparkling opening nights, backstage love affairs, um, all sorts of meeting of famous people. And the book has that in it. But what they didn't know that was that the longest, most important role of my entire life was Lillian Captain Felch's daughter. Um, and it was a role that I never auditioned for, but both was stuck with and um, was given as a gift. My mother lived so long, she lived till she was over 103, Richard, that after my father died, she was expected to wilt like most, like many widows do. When he died, May the 11th, 1996, soon after she became just like her name, a lily, a rubrum lily, she just blossomed and she would live till over 103. And in the 18 years after my father's death, we solved all the questions we had about our relationship. My mother didn't give birth to me until she was 40. So the gap in our generations was considerable, vast, and had to be dealt with. It was very challenging for her. And um, I did not get a lot of approval in my early years. It's probably why I entered the fantasy life. Well, you said that you wrote this book as, uh, you know, because of the pandemic. Uh, do you think that this book would have been written if the pandemic had not happened? It was written not as well because I had no distractions. I didn't write it because of the pandemic. Yeah. I, I was asked to write it. I wrote it. I was starring in something. Oh, I would be um, the prompter by Wade Dooley at at uh, at Bay Street for Scott Schwartz, where I played an aging diva who could no longer remember her lines and had to have an earpiece 
and she always blamed the man who was feeding her her lines for prompter for the problem in her life. It's really very interesting. It's based on a true story where Dooley was prompter to great stars, mm -hmm. and after the show, he became the prompter to uh, to a very famous actor mm -hmm. who was doing a play uh, and couldn't complete it. It was it was Faye Dunaway. And he was wow. Her that was afterwards. He's a marvelous man and a marvelous actor, and I hope the prompter gets legs. But anyway, I was writing this this memoir, the first draft, that during the time I was taking on very, very substantial roles, and uh, which culminated in playing Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the Supreme Court Justice, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in September, October of 2019. And then I came home, I did a picture for Paramount, and a couple of concerts, the last one being February 22nd last year mm -hmm. in Houston, and then the pandemic hit and I was isolated and there, there was no work. So the only work to do was to shine up that manuscript. And I had to revamp the whole thing. I actually, my draft two is very, very different. I completely revamped it in a format that I understood the best, which is a theater format. I wrote it in three acts with two intermissions. You're welcome to go to the bathroom as you're listening, as you're listening or reading. Lilyville, and with scenes instead of chapters, we have scenes. And the final um, chapters have to do with a curtain call. It has to do with exit music. And instead of just saying credits, it's cast party. And at the cast party, I list all the marvelous people who have helped me assemble this work about my life through the lens of my mother. And my hope is that the book is profound enough to apply to your mother's. To apply, to apply to all of us with And it's mother. coming out in time for Mother's Day. So everyone that's listening, you know, by all means, get the book. But I want to ask you, what was, uh, you know, and perhaps you've answered this, but to go into a little bit more detail, when someone sits down to write their memoirs, um, what was the main impetus for you in terms of putting your story, your mom's story, your story together on paper and do you feel that, when did you feel or knew that you had achieved that goal? Well, first of all, the impetus to do it, Richard Deere, was the death of my mother. She had a glorious life and a fantastic death. And she was in the arms of my brother and me and my beloved nephew, Noah Felchie, when she died. It was just the three of us. And uh, she had a cerebral hemorrhage from which she would never recover. Mm. But she died. She was a medical experiment at 95 years old. I read about this. She was patient number 13, stage one, experimentation of replacing the, the aortic valve of the heart percutaneously. That means through the skin, through the vein, not by opening up the chest. Because if you open up people nine, 95 years old, guess what happened? You can't close them up again because the epidermis is so delicate. She received the heart, the, sorry, the aortic valve of a pony, of a pony at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital while I was starring in Hello, Dolly, while I was doing all this. And every night the, the cast fan would take me to Columbia Presbyterian. I remember. Faith, and I would sleep in my mother's room on a small uh, chair that would become a bed, you know, one of those times. And then the woman in the semi-private room on the next bed died. So then I took the woman's bed. I would just lay on this rubber mattress and bring my own blank. And um, when, when my mother died, I guess besides climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, which I did soon after her death with my son, Brandon, uh, we, I wanted to make her ubiquitous. I thought what I had to learn from her was so enormous about life. And she had played such a major role in my life, whereas I had based my whole life on my father. It's no coincidence I was on Law and Order for 13 seasons. I was on mm -hmm. Law and Order for 13 seasons because I was like the Suzuki student of litigation. My father was a litigator who took me when I was a little pot to the Supreme Court where he tried a case. So when I played Danielle Melnick, which incidentally had started out as a male role, it was, after, it was a joke of the name Danny Melnick after Danny Melnick, a, a very well-known producer out in Hollywood. They gave me this part and they said, oh, we'll change Dan Daniel to Danielle. And I did that and they said, oh, Oh, she, oh, well, she seems to be doing a pretty good job. So they kept rehiring me to do it. But the truth is, I owe everything to Sidney Felch. It was because I was in the courts early in my life watching my father uh, try his cases. 
Uh, I applied to Harvard Law School. I didn't make it. I just made the waiting list. So instead, I became a lawyer on Law and Order, and I married a Harvard lawyer, Andrew Levy. And this will be our 44th wedding anniversary coming up March. Congratulations. Well, going back to you know your career as an actress, uh, beyond uh, your tours in your home in your apartment, uh, when did you make the decision that you wanted to pursue it as a career? Well, when I asked to go to Juilliard after I graduated from Scarsdale High, my mother's reply was, "You're not going to a trade school." So that was that. <laughs> that one, and I was accepted at Vassar and uh, Smith, and uh, rejected at Holyoke, and uh, and Sarah Lawrence. I was accepted, and Dean Fitzgerald said you should go to Sarah Lawrence. You're so creative. Uh, meanwhile, uh, there's Yentl. There's Yentl. Little Yentl. That was an early break in my career. I was a very lucky girl to get that. I went to Sarah Lawrence. I majored in philosophy. Very useful to make a living. Mm -hmm. Major in philosophy. And I graduated, uh, waitlisted at Harvard Law, the only law school I applied to really to be near my father, his alma mater. And I'd worked in his law office as his, as his librarian, you know, making sure the books were in order. But I think I got a dollar an hour or two dollars an hour just to be near my father. Um, and I won a fellowship in acting from the McKnight's Minnesota Mining. Uh, Knight Fellowship in Acting to the Tyrone Guthrie Theater. They paid for your master's degree and they sent you to... Uh, to the Guthrie to be an intern, if you will. Not really an intern because we were paid. So it would be a journeyman. I was a journeyman in the company, but truly, I really carried Spears for two seasons. I had 23 roles in 11 plays because my roles were so small. Like in Cyrano, you'd come on, you'd come on as a actress, you change your outfit, you come on act two as a, a boy poet, you come on in act three as a nun. That's how big my parts were. <laughs> and uh, I got lucky. Cyrano became a musical, and they needed somebody who could sing and dance. And it would go from the Guthrie, starring Chris Plummer, to the Palace Theater in New York. And I was in that company playing the food seller. I had 14 lines, the red dress. My, there's Julia. I did that for Jack O'Brien. There's Julia. Mm -hmm. Jack O'Brien in San Diego at, at the National Shakespeare Festival. Anyway, now, I, yes. Go, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just finished 14 lines in a red dress, but my line was the first line in the play. So I made my Broadway <laughs> debut in May of 1973 at the Palace Theater. I came into New York, went right to Broadway, saying oranges, pomegranates, lemonade. And that was the really? beginning of the career. And then 18 months later, I did Yentl and had the honor of being put on the marquee of the O'Neill Theater, where the Book of Mormon what was, was that, What was that moment like for you to see your name on the marquee for the first time? It was shocking. The whole thing was shocking. I was lucky. <coughs> Before Yentl went to Broadway, was at the uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music, 1974-75, for a limited run, I think six or eight weeks. And it was on its way to Broadway, but I had another job to do Rogers and Hart for Richard Rogers, who was alive, for Cheveloff directing, Buster Davis conducting. And I remember Mr. Rogers gave me, my romance doesn't have to happen. Mm. Yeah, that's what he gave me. He gave me that song and a few other songs. It was it was wonderful. And um, Richard Rogers, when I met him, offered me another musical called Rex, starring Nicole Williamson, where I would play Anne Boleyn in the first act, probably get my head chopped off, and the young Princess Elizabeth the first in the second act. Well, I was thrilled, and of course, I changed my name from Terry Sutova, so to avoid typecasting in my contract for Yentl that went to Broadway. I, they agreed to let me out to go do Rex for Mr. Rogers uh, six or seven weeks after Yentl opened in October. So I would have to go into rehearsals, I think, at the end of even at the end of November. And Ruth Gordon, who was the matron of honor at my wedding to Andy and Garson Kanan, who directed me in another play I did called Dreyfus in Rehearsal, where I played Lucy Dreyfus from Dreyfus Trials of the 19th Century, where a Jewish officer in the French army was accused of being a traitor to France and was unjustly incarcerated. Uh, it was an act of anti-Semitism. In all events, everybody said, leave Yentl and go do Rex, everybody except Garson Kanan, who also incidentally was the director of Funny Girl, directed Funny Girl uh, for Barbara Streisand. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. He took me to Sardis and he took me to Sardis for lunch. I was still doing Yentl eight times a week. 
we had opened up world, we were we were a big success, I'm happy to say. And he said, listen, Jim Jick, and it means little toy in Yiddish, and probably now with gender equality, it would be looked down upon, but it was a it was a term of affection. He said, listen, mm-hmm. Jim Jick, Yentl is a hit, and it's your show. You never know when your show will come up again. Rex is Nicole Williamson's show. And yes, you're playing the leading lady and you're playing these two different parts, but we don't know the fate of Rex. You have a bird in the hand here. Never leave a hit, Jim Jack. Never leave a hit. And for some reason, I listened to that one vote, Garson Canaan's. And I went back to the uh, producers and they had already come to me and they said, stay with our show. We will double your salary and put your name on the marquee. And they doubled my salary. And they put my name on the marquee and I got a car and driver, I think. And Rex turned out to fail. Nicole Williamson, a chorus boy, a chorus boy I knew because he was in Rogers and Hart. He was brought up on charges. The show closed in a few weeks. And Yentl established me for the New York theater community, which I am ever grateful. Very grateful. I mean, they're my loves. I've spent... In 2021, it'll, it'll be 50 years I will have been on the professional stage. I started in 1971 at the Guthrie, 1973 on Broadway. And I want to go back to Terry Sue Tutova. When, where, and how did that transition take place? And why the name Tova? So, um, interesting in the book, my mother name my mother's name is Lillian H. Kaplan, but her Hebrew name was Hanalea, and she had an alter ego that she called Hortense when she was a young adolescent. Oh, here is a picture of my playing solo piano. I was a pianist before I was an actress. My mother Lillian, her custom made turban, looking on. My father. I love that picture so much. And my my brother David and I talk about how with our first Steinway and even our second when we finally got the Steinway grant. It was only a single seat at the piano bench. There wasn't a piano bench. It was a single seat at the piano. And you sat alone and you practiced. And that my mother, who was also a wonderful pianist, she and I never played a four-handed piece. When I asked me why I wrote a book, that's a reason to write a book. It's an absolute reason to write a book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The picture next to it is a picture of my daughter, Amanda, and I, playing a four-handed piece for my mother's 86th birthday. I guess maybe it was her 85th. It was the birthday right after my father's death. So I guess it was her 85th birthday, which I did at Windows on the World with Jay Magazine, who was my, I was coaching. I know I sound like I've been all over the place, but I was coaching yeah. girls. I was, Amanda needed a coach. So I coached the five to 10-year-old girls for five years. And Jay Magazine was my... Uh, was my coach, was my team manager, Melissa Magazine. Her, her, his daughter was on, on the team and she's a wonderful player. The Jay Magazine who ran Windows on the World, ran the whole thing with me, couldn't have been better. And of course we lost him. We mm-hmm. lost him 9-11. But in all events, the metaphor is I was alone at the piano and I said to my mother as a little girl, you know, I love the piano because if you're good to the piano, the piano will be good to you people you can never depend on. So it was very sad. I mean, I had a mother who was not verbal in her expression of love. And I was very verbal, uh, maybe Mm -hmm. because my father had the gift of gab as as a litigator. So I had one parent who said, Terry Sue, do-do-do-do-do. I love you, do-do-do-do-do. Yes, I do. do -do -do." And another person, another person was my mother was just like, are you ready? Are we going? You can't wear that blouse with that skirt. What are you doing? Don't think crazy. Change your outfit. So I had this big dichotomy in my parenting. Now you ask about Terry Sudatova. Yes. I fell in love with a boy who was at Wesleyan while I was at Sarah Lawrence. And his name was Michael Fairchild. He's still on the planet. He's a wonderful photographer. That was always his dream. And he, he followed his bliss, as Joe Campbell would say. And we fell in love in my sophomore year. There I am with my TV mm-hmm. daughter, Rachel Bloom, on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. It was a wonderful experience. Anyway, uh, we were head-to-head at Theater by the Sea one day, uh, mm. romantically involved. And uh, Michael said to me, what kind of a name is Terry Sue for a girl like you? First of all, you live in the, the North, and it's so... It's There's a title right there. 
Terry Sue, a girl like you. Right. And he said, what else were you called? I said, well, I was called Tova in Sunday school. And the truth is I was called Tova in Hebrew school. And my Hebrew name was always Tova. I was named after my mother's aunt Tilly, who died of, uh, of uh, I think, tuberculosis or cancer in her 30s. So Terry came after Tilly. And I was named after my great-grandmother, Sarah Abrahams, in England, who lived a long life. You give a Jewish child uh, one name after somebody who lived a short life, you make sure you give him to give her or him a longer name uh, for the for the second name. So uh, he said, Tova, you were called Tova. Well, that's a name. And because of that boy, I changed my name from Terry to the Tova, and like any 18-year-old, had no sense of the consequences of this. That changing my name would change the landscape of my entire life, of my career. Because, you know, Shakespeare says, what's in a name arose by any other name that smell is sweet. It, I do not find that true. There's a lot in the name because people's lives are not about you. Mm-hmm. People's lives are about themselves. And now, was there anyone in your family who still calls you Terry Sue? Well, some of my blood sisters from Quaker Ridge still call me Terry. And okay. um, my oldest friends, and now I have no attachment. They don't, nobody has to call me Tova. They can call me Terry, but everybody calls me and um, and it's a name that has brought me great honor. It changed my perceived value. The international and national Jewish community perceived me as either European, Orthodox, and learned that I knew about my religion. I was neither European. I'm certainly not Orthodox. I'm just a cheerleader from, from Quaker Ridge School. And <laughs> I am interested in learning. So when I was practically, I won't say given the role of Yentl, but when I won the role of Yentl, because how bad could a Tova felt you be doing Yentl, you know? With a name like that, she's got to be like, that's what Carson came in used to say. I delved into that part. I went to Borough Park. I researched. I disguised myself as a boy. And with the great, great um, rabbi, Arya Kaplan, may he rest in peace, I was snuck into a boy's yeshiva. I remember putting gloves on, not only so they couldn't discover I was a girl, but also so that I would not touch any of the young boys, which would have been a sacrilege. In other words, yes. because he was committing a sin, I didn't want them to commit a sin. And this wonderful rabbi took me in, and I wore his wife's scheidel, and I dressed up not as a Hasidic boy, because if I looked like a Hasidic boy, they'd expect me to know too much. I dressed as a modern Orthodox um, kid without without payas. And um, they thought I was just coming to see the school, and I watched them, I watched them, daven, you know, pray and learn with fervor. And I just took that gentle wall and tried to deliver it in all its gothic authenticity. And uh, also, it was my avenue for meeting Barbara Streisand. So, so the Tova Felchuness of my life has ended up being a very good thing. And also, if it's the way life is, there's called a you might Golda. as well ride the horse in the direction it's cantering, in the direction it's going. There's Golda Meir, one of my yeah. favorite. A phenomenal, people. phenomenal, phenomenal performance. Wow. Um, okay. Out of all the roles that you've done, Tova, is there any role that was difficult for you to let go? And are there any roles that are, well, I, every role that you do is still within you. Uh, but it, was there any role that was very difficult to let go uh, after a particular run? Yes, I think to this day, RPG is difficult for me to let go. A, the justice invited me to chambers, so I got to be with her four times before she died in September. I think it was even September 18th, and 18 is a mystical number, high for life. Mm-hmm. And I think she was taken on a Shabbat, and there's a whole thing about being taken on a Friday or Saturday that God takes his best, his tzaddikim, the learned ones, the wise ones. the one. So this woman was just remarkable. She was so open-hearted and so honestly humble. And we're supposed to do this play. And if we don't get to do this play, I will probably do a one-woman piece about her. As much as I love my producer, Elizabeth Weber, and all the other producers and, uh, and want, uh, want to come in with Sisters in Law by Jonathan Shabiro, if for some reason we don't, I'm going to resurrect RPG. And, uh, you have to. You have to. But you will, you, so we would have Golda. We would have RBG. And just to bring us down a little, we have Leona. They have quite a well, they, well, you're reading my mind. I want to talk a little bit about Leona. Uh, and you have a phenomenal team. Jeff Harner, uh, Jim Bossy, 
two men that I love dearly. Um, how did to uh, how did Leona come about for you, and why the choice uh, to put it in a cabaret setting to start with? I'll tell you how it came along. It, it came along because I was offered a musical called The Queen of Me by three marvelous young artists. And they could not get full capitalization, which probably needed at least $13 million to get on its feet. And I went to the boys and I said, look, we're not getting this musical up yet. Would you give me permission to use your score and fashion a my own nightclub act or my own concert about Leona and at least get your music out into the planet, out into the universe? And they very lovingly gave me um, permission. And that is how I then called upon Jeff Harner, who not only do I love, but he was my uh, director for Aging is Optional, and he was absolutely stupendous. Mm -hmm. He's a stupendous human being, but he's a brilliant artist and director. I think Jeff Harner understands the secret that Sidney Lumet taught me. Before I did Daniel for Sidney Lumet, the director, the great Sidney Lumet, took my hands, my face in his hands, and right before I was about to film, he said, I'm so lucky to have you. I'm the luckiest director in the world. You're so brilliant. You're so wonderful. You are a gift to me. I should have filmed your audition. Thank you for being here. Okay, roll camera, please. <laughs> he may have loved me dearly, but the point is he empowered me. And that's what Jeff does when he directs you. He is there, he has plenty of judgments, he has plenty of opinions, but he empowers the performer to do their best through a cushion of support, which brings me to my mothering. That's why I told Brandon and Amanda, I love you because you breathe. And I would also put in them what I hoped for them. At that time, I'd say, I love you because you breathe. Yes, mommy. You're the most empathic, kindest person. You come into a room, you see how do I serve this room? How do I help these people? Should I help clean up? How can I help? You're so empathic. And they go, what does empathic mean? And I said, it means to feel with somebody. So I put in them what I hoped for them. And Jeff has that great gift. And James Fossey, forget about it. I mean, he writes- uh, He was my musical director many years ago. I love, oh love, love, love oh that baby. He's just brilliant. And I, my biggest project is to get him out of his apartment to start playing for me again. He is very uh, uh, intelligently wary. He and I both had COVID at the same time. And wow. uh, February, March, and I believe we're both fine. I've had my second shot. I certainly hope Jimmy has at least uh, scheduled his first, but he's underage. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether, what, when, he, when he will get it, but I love him. I miss him. He is musical directing a show by Zoom right now. And usually we get together on Friday nights. I run a Zoom Shabbat for my entire family. Something I've never done in my life. We're on our 40, we're going on our 45th Shabbat, our 44th. That's Shabbat. incredible. That's wonderful. I want to go back to your mom for just a moment. Writing this book, was there something that, an epiphany moment for you, something that you learned or about your mom that you did not really think about or realize prior to sitting down and writing this book? Well, what I experienced, before I say that, I just want to be clear that James Bossy, Jeff Harner, and I created uh, Yona together, as Richard said. We were co-collaborators. They were not merely my musical director. We, we wrote this thing together. So, um, to go back to what I discovered is how profoundly I loved my mother. And how to try to see the world through her lens was a way to forgive her for not loving me in the formative years of my life in a way that I could understand. Mm -hmm. I couldn't understand it. When I was a little girl and she asked me if I was adopted, I, I got frightened. I went up to my father. Am I adopted? Am I adopted? He said, what are you talking about? I was there when he came out of mommy's belly. That's what he would say. I was there, mm -hmm. December the 27th, in an undisclosed decade. I was there. <laughs> yeah. And 
my mother probably was just saying, you're so capable, you're so this, you're so that. That's what she told me 20 years later. You're so this, you're so that. How could you possibly have come from me? So I, her own Michigas spilled over as, as parents do. Mm -hmm. Our, anything that's out about us spills over to our children. Children don't do what you say. Mm -hmm. Children do what they see. There's my mother and I. I took her to Disney World because I was a VIP guest for the 100th birthday of Walt Disney. We were in a parade with our beloved Joyce, who was my mother's executive housekeeper and caretaker for 25 years in our family through my father's life and after my father's life. We all went down to Disney, and that was with the Goofy and Chip. And uh, we had a—I think it's Goofy. Is that Goofy? So, it's and, Goofy. And, yeah, we but had, it may be we, Dale. What? It may be oh, Dale. We, uh, maybe Dale. Not Chip. <laughs> we, had, we had a really good time. Uh, mommy, of course, liked um, it, what was it called Endica. I even forgot the thing with all the different international homes. Scott, Scott. She she loved that. Epcot. Epcot, yeah, Epcot, and she loved the more uh, the more mature area of uh, Disney World. But we had a great time. The fireworks every night, and uh, and how well how old was your mom at this point? Uh, she's ageless, obviously, but uh, how old was she at this point? She must have been in her nineties. I took her everywhere from the moment my father died on May eleventh, nineteen ninety six. So my mother was yeah, she was just to turn eighty five. So I guess that thing at the at the towers, at the, you know, the, the, where you saw Amanda and I playing the piano was when she turned 80, 86. So we took her, from 86, I took her to Greece. I was shooting a picture in Rhodes uh, with Ian Holm called Oh Jerusalem. I took her there. I took her on, and Dad, too. I was singing for the Holland America cruises. Oh, my God, they were great, the international cruises. And the last cruise I did for them before their booker had was retired, and they got a booker from Vegas, and then all the Vegas dancers took the place of myself, uh, Joel Gray, Marvin Hamlish. We we really had a had a ball. Um, golly. Anyway, the last one I had a handicapped cabin for my parents because that's the best they could do, but it was big. I had a first class cabin for myself, and then I had a regular cabin for the nanny and my two children. And we went all over Europe as I sang my little heart out for for two days of the eight. Um, anyway, I took her everywhere and i gave her parties every year for her 100th birthday it was at the university club for 101st it was at this gorgeous entity up in westchester uh for the 102nd uh it was i forget where it was 103rd was at the metropolitan club in new york and she would die 10 weeks later mm. so when that last money was spent that i gladly took out of my and my brother's account mm -hmm. um it's the best thing we ever did. She she ended her life doing a vaudeville act. Where David would give David and my beloved nephew Zach Felt, she would give my mother the feed lines, and she would do her punchlines. And she was she was a riot. You know, Tova, I rate your parts by how you look. Golda, I rate your parts by how you look. Dolly Levi was a ten. Golda Meir, zero. <laughs> amazing, amazing. amazing. So what did you learn about yourself from writing this book? I learned to forgive, that forgiveness and cutting myself a break, to forgive myself, myself for living my life as only I could through my lens. So it lacked a certain understanding of my mother when I needed her so badly. Uh, so I divorced myself from my mother, if you would. I had a whole secret life, you know. Right right, right through Billy Coker, my seventh grade boyfriend, calling through my bedroom window to make out with me. <laughs> it's right out of Romeo and Juliet, though he would have been a very appropriate match. Um, oh, uh, uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, nobody stood a chance once I met Andrew Harris Levy. My husband came backstage February 16, 1976. So therefore, our anniversary is coming up this That's week. That's right. February 16th, yes. Tuesday, and that was our first date. And there's Neil Patty Pepe. and I, he played a rap. I, I played Naomi Bunch. We were at a bunch bar mitzvah. Kahala, 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 kahala
I want to ask you, out of all the roles that you've done, what was the most difficult role for you to uh, tackle on Broadway? And tackle, I'm using for a specific reason. Well, they're all like your children. You love your roles. Mm -hmm. I had the most challenging time, no fault of mine, or PJ Benjamin's or anybody else, was Sarah Va, because Mitch Lee... And, and Richard Nash had a big fall out in Boston, and the writer left the show. And the writer's note is very strong. We could not change one word of the show, and the show was not worked out. So you can go pray to the gods every night in intermission. Oh, my God, we're at the Broadway theater saying, please make Act 2 work tonight. Please make Act 2 work tonight. And it's not going to happen if it's not on the page. And we did every, mm -hmm. every way but up. We bent ourselves like pretzels. Um, so I would say that was most challenging because there was animus, unfortunate breaking of, of relationships. You know, in the end, I think it was Mendelssohn who said, all that matters is love and work. And as he was dying, he said, all that matters is love because from love, everything else sprouts. And rather than being, or, or was created, rather than being a schmaltz herring about this, it's really true. There, there's a loving relationship between my extraordinary partner on the trapeze and Pippin. That was just a physical challenge, but it was not an artistic challenge because uh, Diane Paula, probably one of my children, to say hello. Is that your phone? Hello, Bonnie. Hello, Bonnie. Hello, Bonnie. Can you see my Bonnie? I don't know if you can see him. Hello. hello. Oh, wow. And Levi Hello. and Zoe. That is my oldest grandchild. Of three. Uh, she's adorable. ¿Qué estás haciendo? Estás comiendo, mi amor. Diga, escucha. Grammy está sobre el televisión ahorita. Ok. Yo voy, yo voy a telefonar a ti después del, del programa. ¿Estás comiendo? ¿Estás feliz? Sí, sí. So, ¿Es rico? ¿Qué estás comiendo, mi amor? ¿Qué estás comiendo? That's ¿Qué great. Estás comiendo? God bless her. All right. All right. We'll speak to you later. Okay. Thank you so much for calling. Now I have a surprise for you. Somebody what? wanted to, yes, I have a surprise for you. Somebody wanted to stop by and say hello. Um, you, uh, the two of you have probably gone to heights together that you probably haven't done with too many people, uh, but he just wanted to say hello. And here he is. Bobby. Hi, Toba. <laughs> no, sweetheart. The reason I was able to do trapeze, I learned very early in my career that you don't actually rehearse on Broadway. You perform. That you have to be the doctor who's in when you go to your first rehearsal. You don't have to be prepared. You have to be prepared. Yes. In the old days, uh, within 48 hours, you could legally fire any actor. And mm -hmm. there was so much money and growing money at stake. That if you didn't know what you were doing or showed promise, very often you would lose your, could lose your job. <laughs> that process was something that had to be worked out both at home mm -hmm. and in the So the second I got this part, the second I got this part, um, Barry Weisler said, you've got it. We're dying to have you. And Fran said to me, Tova, why are you so fat? Is she fat? Isn't she fat? She's really fat. <laughs> Yes. You do. Oh my God! Just let yourself go. I mean, what's happening? And Barry said, "Fran, don't worry. Tova will lose weight." I said, "Fran, I've been playing Golda, and you know, and and just relaxing. What can I tell you?" She said, "Well, you can't. You can't do trapeze like that." Barry, what are we going to do? <laughs> Barry said, she'll be okay. She'll lose weight. The second, the second I got the part at 130 pounds. I called Bobby Hedgeland Taylor and he took me in. I went to his trapeze school and I took lessons in trapeze incessantly. Then I went, by that time I was beginning to lose weight. So I went from 130 to like 122. You were so light in general. Yeah. By the time I got to go to playing a bear time was 112 pounds. And I still am about 113. When I had COVID. You look great. You look wonderful. Thank you. When I had COVID, I lost weight. And then I just kept losing weight. Also, they have now, now listen up, my darling friends. They have 
definitively, according to, according to Sanjay Gupta, related the amount of sugar in your blood to the appearance of dementia. That apparently with too much sugar or things that can't be handled by insulin, the brain cells also can't eat an overabundance and they get starved. They're unable to digest. So be careful of your diet, careful of the bread and be careful of the sweets. I have to talk to myself because I always have a chocolate every day because one of my mother's sentences were chocolate and laughter on a daily basis. I said, How many <laughs> chocolate and laughter on a daily basis. Talk chocolate. It's an aphrodisiac. I live in hope. I live in hope. So anyway, um, uh, I, I can only tell you that Bobby was totally instrumental in my success as Berta. Because when I got to the first rehearsal, they said, she, she's, she's fast. She's going to be okay. Because <laughs> they, the less they can rehearse with you on Broadway, yeah. the more money they can save. And mm -hmm. these very responsible people, very. We had to do the routine every single day before every single show. So yep. I, I also I, felt that I learned from watching you. And also I felt like I had a master class every time that we worked together because you not only took, I was there to give you the physical part of the routine, but you came in with the 24 seven data. You came in with this other, this other, this fully realized person. And that was what I found was just fascinating because I had also trained Andrea for Boston. So I had the, the routine in my head and I would never forget that I had the movement in my head, but I also missed some of the directions and you would yell at me, Bobby, I'm going the wrong way. And I would have to turn you the other way. And I was like, I know, but you're doing the right moves. <laughs> so, but uh, I felt like I went to school. And uh, for me, that was, and, and I, I, it, it's, it's amazing that your 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 book is coming out and on your relationship with your mom. My mom passed from COVID uh, in March, and I also went to I went to work on a book. So I actually um I just finished my first draft of a cookbook based on my relationship with my mother and my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just love that we've sort and of. And I'm going to be having the lemon <laughs> stage Noki sooner than you know. <laughs> yes, from really. your mom. From your mom. Yes. But uh, yeah, that was fit. And you actually met my mom backstage. I brought her. That was the last Broadway show she got to see. Was Pippa. I get it. So. I did. That was my. That was my mother's last Broadway yep. show she got to see. That's and and she was. She was like. She. She couldn't con conceptualize that I taught you. That I taught you to do that. She yeah, just. She didn't have. The, she just didn't. You know. She just thought I got free tickets for this thing. <laughs> Oh, you absolutely taught me. And, and the, that part, as you know, Richard, and of course, Bobby knows better than any of us, it's about the reclamation of youth and the going back years. I That story starts my book out. It starts it starts, starts with that story in Lilyville, how I had a, uh, a swing set as a child. And as a three and four year old, I would hang upside down on my childhood trapeze. So when I walked into the theater for this audition, without Bobby, this is before Bobby got to me. I rode my bike down the audition. I remember my agent saying, you're gonna ride your bike down. I said, what better way to go to an audition for a trapeze than to be in biking clothes and be hardy? And I walked in and I was hoisted 30 feet in the air, you know, no belt, no mat, no insurance. And Barry calls up to me, Tova, 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 are you scared, scared, scared? <laughs> I realized, no, 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 I said, I said, are you, you, you? And I got that part without singing or dance, singing a note or dancing a step because I wasn't afraid to hang upside down on a trapeze. And then the minute they gave it to me, which was soon, I think he went running down the street. I got on my bike and I was taught by David. Oh my God, he's so famous. He was my teacher in, 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 um, in Los Angeles. It'll come to me. But anyway, I was taught by him that when you're done with an audition, get out of the room, get out of the room. So I said, thank you very much. I got on my bike and he went running after the bike. He said, what's the matter with you? Here's the script. Here's the script. And I got the part and then I called Bobby. I said, let me tell you something. I need some big help. You actually, that phone call was really amazing because I'm like, this is Tova, the Tova? I had just seen, like I had just seen you and I tell you in Tova's balcony three times, or uh, Golda's balcony, sorry. <laughs> it's Freudian slip. Um, three times I'd seen Golda's balcony. And I was like, because, you know, when you get that message on your phone, I'm like, wait a minute, is that that 
Yo, hello, hi, yes, of course, sure, I'll help you out, no problem. <laughs> but you yeah. know, I had known your work, and um, and and it's it's been fa it's fascinating just hearing this interview because I there's stuff I knew about you because I did my due diligence when I met you the first time, but there's so much I cannot wait to get your book because it's like we've been living a parallel life this past year. So, uh, you know. Um, yes, and my condolences. Of Mine too. Yeah. Bobby, my mom was a very special person. She was very, very funny. And one of the things she taught me, you got to laugh every day. And yeah. no matter what, you're a piece of very chocolate. funny lady. And, yeah. you, you know, and I'll have a piece of chocolate and think about your mom as well. <laughs> Same thing. But not too much. Bobby, thank you for stopping thank by. Thank you. I love you guys. Bye. Bye. And happy birthday, Richard. Thank you so much. Thank you. Happy good day, Richard. Thank and you. it's good to see you, Tova. Good to Goodbye. see you. Bye. Thank you. Well, Tova, I can't believe it, but we are at the end of our show. Um, it's been such an honor to get to know you a little bit better and to learn about your mom. And the book, everyone, the book is available through Amazon. Uh, you can go to Amazon.com. Um, I want to, I always end every show. First of all, I want to thank everyone for being here today. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, and I hope you did, please go to my website, richardskipper.com. Sign your thoughts about the show in my guest book. That helps to boost me in other markets. I also want to let everyone know that if you are around tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock, I'm going to be celebrating the one and only Jason Graw, who is one of my favorite entertainers. Um, I also end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list. Uh, the third name that pops up, Reach out to that person, call them, let them know what they mean to you, not with an email, not with a text, not with a private message, a phone call. Uh, as our dear friend David Friedman always says, we're all in this together, uh, but we're not in the same boat. You don't know what someone else is going through. So take the time to reach out. And also, when you go to Amazon, buy two copies of this book. Keep one for yourself. Send one to your mom, and if your mom has moved on, uh, send it to the third friend on your friends list. May I, may I say, anybody who buys the book uh, now, before it goes on the stands exactly eight weeks from now, I will personally sign a book plate for you. You just have to go on www.tovafelcher.com, write me that you bought a book, and send me the receipt, Hashed and Sis, and, I will, and, and your address, and I will send you to Richard skipper with all my love Tova Belcher. thank you i'm gonna do that i'm gonna do that and before you go um because i've got one more surprise for you uh just a little one and i hope that you enjoy it but before we have that surprise i'm going to give you the final word anything that you want to say about anything that we talked about today that you want to expound upon anything that we didn't talk about that you wish that we had or any message that you just want to put out to everyone who's watching now. And then I've got uh, a very special message from Tova after she speaks to you live. Oh, well, first of all, thank you so much. I've really, the most important thing is that if you want to buy the book, I can have a personal interaction with you by giving you this personalized book play. But most importantly, young actors come to me and they ask me for my advice just because I've been around so long. The most important thing is not just never give up, but to remember you only need one yes. You just need one yes. So when I was your age, I sent out a hundred resumes to a hundred different summer stock companies. I was in the late 60s. I was still at Sarah Lawrence. And I got back 10 responses. And from the 10 responses, I got eight auditions. I only got one yes. And it was by Theater by the Sea. And that was the summer I would change my name from Terry Sudatova. I was actually Terry Fairchild up there. But that one yes was the launch of a career of a, of a teenager uh, who very much wanted to be in the theater. Thank That's you. And I worked at Theater by the Sea. Great theater. I did. Don't give up. Just don't. No. Every day is a new day. Don't give up. And that message continues with this clip. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Thank you, Richard. Here is a secret. I never have told Maybe you'll understand why I believe if I refuse to grow old 
I can stay young till I die. Now I've known the fears of sixty years. I've had troubles and tears. That was a glitch. Hold on. There was a glitch there. Here is a secret I never have told. Maybe you'll understand why. I believe if I refuse to grow old, I can stay young till I die. Now I've known the fears of sixty years. I've had troubles and tears by the score. But the only thing I trade them for is sixty more. Okay, this time I want to hear it from everybody. So put down your guacamole chips and your Amish chicken and join me. Oh, one, two, three. years on Broadway. So I'll throw off.